Hello, good morning and good evening, everybody. This is Patricia Jerwitz from Responsible Sourcing Network. I would like to welcome you to uh, Responsible Sourcing Network's webinar today, the findings on the 2018 cotton harvest in Uzbekistan and uh, Turkmenistan. I um, thank you for joining us. I would like to go over who our uh, who our presenters are, or actually before that, I will do the logistics um, for the um, how we will go through the whole presentation is that first we'll have our presenters and then we will have a Q&A at the very end. Um, if you are interested in asking a question, uh, please put it into the go to dialog box. Uh, written or at the end we can unmute you if you raise your hand and you can ask your question live. Uh, we are recording this webinar um, however we ask that for anybody listening if they ask a question at the end you use the Chatham House rule and you do not uh, quote them however you can quote the presenters. Next slide. So our presenters today um, will be Bennett Freeman. I know he's having some difficulty getting on and needs the call-in number, but we'll make sure that uh, Bennett is able to get on to share a few words. Uh, from Bennett Freeman and Associates, Allison Gill and Umida Neryozova from Uzbek German Forum. And we'll also be hearing from Lus Ruslan Mayatiev from Al Alternative Turkmenistan News. So just to go over the agenda, I, after I wrap up, we will have a, a quick overview of the history of what's been happening um, with the Uzbek uh, harvest, cotton harvest, over the last couple of decades. As many of you know, uh, the cotton campaign and Responsible Sourcing Network have been addressing this issue and highlighting the challenges in forced labor in Uzbekistan over the last 11 years. Um, so we're looking forward to, um, to changes afoot. Uh, we'll also then have an update from Umida um, and Allison regarding uh, this past 2018 harvest in Uzbekistan and their observations through their monitoring, as well as we'll then discuss very briefly next steps uh, regarding how we can address and move forward the <clears throat> ending forced labor in Uzbekistan. Next, we'll hear from Ruslan, who will give us an update on his observations and uh, the monitoring that Alternative Turkmenistan News has done for the 2018 harvest in Turkmenistan. And at the end, we'll open it up for Q&A. As uh, many of you know, the situation in Uzbekistan as well as Turkmenistan uh, is different than many other forced labor situations around the world. I, due to the government orchestration or the state sponsorship of forced labor in both of those countries. Uh, this is not the case in every country, but it is uh, left over from the Soviet system. The situation in Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, unfortunately, is still this forced mobilization of workers, of um, especially to harvest uh, cotton uh, both adults and children over the years, and both um, Umida, Allison, and Ruslan will go into details on all of that. All right. Um, I'm not sure if we have Bennett on the phone yet. Uh, let me just double check and see if he is there. Bennett, are you with us? Okay, then why don't we go ahead and <clears throat> move on to uh, Umida. Actually, I could just give a, a very um, brief background. We'll bring Bennett back in later on. Uh, but I had mentioned that it was um, 
that the state orchestration was is has been left over from Soviet times, and uh, we estimate that it's it's been about 70 or 80 years that forced labor has been happening in Uzbekistan. Uh, in 2006, 2007 uh, is when the first uh, reports had started coming out um, regarding forced labor that were highlighted in Western media, as well as there was a request from a group of uh, very Uzbek activists asking for a global boycott of Uzbek cotton due to the children and adults being forced to work um, upwards of a million people. And uh, as a result, the cotton campaign, a number of NGOs, as well as uh, investors and companies and business associations have all joined together to highlight this issue and have been implementing a variety of strategies to address it using the ILO complaint mechanism, uh, government uh, interaction and, and policy for reform, uh, as well as you all know that the Responsible Sourcing Network started the Uzbek Cotton Pledge in 2011. We now have close to 300 brands and retailers who have signed that pledge. Uh, we have seen um, through a lot of this pressure that the Uzbek government did stop sending children on a mass scale to harvest cotton. Uh, so today, and Umida um, could verify to what extent children are um, still picking cotton or not picking cotton. Uh, which we all see as a great success. We're now very much looking forward to the ending of forcing the mobilization of adults to harvest cotton. Um, there was the uh, commitment by the president of Uzbekistan at the United Nations in 2017, saying that he would end forced labor. That was a new administration um, that had just recently taken over and we have received commitments from the government on ending forced labor. The cotton campaign sent a delegation to Uzbekistan in May of this year and um, there were additional represent representatives that went to Uzbekistan as well in the fall in October and November. So we're all um, seeing very much commitment from the government, um, but what is happening on the ground uh, still needs a bit of work. And I will let Omida and Allison give you the details of what they observed with their monitors this year. Uh, thank you very much, Patricia, and uh, good day, everyone. Um, yeah, I've been uh, researching and reporting about um, forced labor. At uh, that time, uh, it was uh, child labor, the biggest problem in the cotton harvest um, uh, in Uzbekistan. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, for the past 10 years, I can't go to Uzbekistan because my citizenship was taken away and I live in Berlin, um, uh, uh, where I found it. and. Um, I'm directing NGO Uzbek German Forum for Human Rights, and uh, every year we conducting um, we have been conducting the, the monitoring on uh, forced labor and child labor in the cotton sector of Uzbekistan. And uh, last year we also conducted independent monitoring uh, of forced labor throughout the entire cotton season uh, in Uzbekistan, which began on September twenty and lasted about 70 days. Uh, our team of 12 monitors uh, went to the cotton fields. Uh, they um, participated in meetings of local administrations. They conducted interviews among employees of various organizations and uh, business uh, across the country. We reviewed Uzbek media and um, uh, and posted uh, uh, information uh, in our uh, weekly chronicle, which you can find on the um, uh, UJ website. Uh, so 2018 was uh, unsuccessful for Uzbek cotton. Uh, this year, uh, last year, um, 2.0 million tons of cotton were produce, produced, which is 
600,000 tons less than it was planned. Um, so according to official data, 2.6 million people were involved in harvesting cotton last autumn. Uh, we found that forced labor remains a systemic problem. The government uh, continued to impose cotton quotas on regions and districts, uh, imposing responsibility to fulfill this on officials. And in turn, these officials imposed quotas on public sector institutions and required uh, uh, institutions to send the uh, employees to uh, pick cotton or pay for pickers. Um, so next slide. Uh, slide. Uh, forced mobilization to pick cotton took place under the uh, direct uh, instructions of heads of districts and regional uh, administrations. The directors of organizations, they receive quotas from the um, local administration to send the employees uh, to pick cotton. Uh, for example, uh, we um, obtained an order signed by the, it's a slide um, eight, uh, signed uh, by the deputy of governor of Namankan region, uh, directing 82 state organizations, including banks, um, uh, different companies, youth unions, tax uh, inspection, Department of Tourism, regional uh, labor unions, uh, to um, and order and other uh, to deliver uh, 660 metric tons of cotton by November 27, 2018. And the order specifies the number of employees of each organization and states that every and um, state that every employee should collect 15 kilograms of cotton every day. Um, this year, payment for cotton pickers was doubled. Uh, pickers were paid 8 cents at the beginning of the harvest and up to 10 cents per 1 kilogram of cotton by the end of the harvest. Uh, this is a positive development, but unfortunately it was not enough to attract a sufficient number of pickers, particularly at the end of the season when the, uh, when the, weather, uh, the weather conditions were harsh and, was, and when the uh, less cotton on the field. And from our monitoring, we can see at what stage the, the problem uh, with forced labor begins. So the uh, cotton quota imposed from central government for the regions is the main um, kind of root of the forced labor problem. Uh, there remains a requirement to fulfill the daily plan for collecting cotton and each region must collect a specific amount of cotton per day. And at the beginning of the season when the weather is warm and there is a lot of cotton, uh, the number of forced pickers is relatively low and only uh, only large organizations send their workers to other areas where there's a lot of cotton and not enough voluntary labor. But by the end of October there is less cotton and voluntary pickers cannot collect like 100 kilogram per day to earn enough money which also they have to also cover the food expenses. Uh, but the regions must fulfill the cutter plan and the harvest continues until the last ball, even if it's not economically viable. viable. Uh, so uh, we observe that employees of various organizations, instead of doing their jobs, they collected only 10, maximum 50 kilograms of cotton per day uh, by the end of November. And that means that uh, people spend more on transportation and food than they earned uh, picking, um, earn picking cotton. Um, and one improvement that I can point out is that uh, medical and educational workers this year were not sent to pick cotton immediately. Uh, not from the very beginning of the cotton, but only at the end of the season. That is, they worked uh, further days than in previous years. 
But nevertheless, coercion to be cut and was on the massive scale and um, was systemic. Uh, one example, uh, for example, uh, our monitor went through one of the regional center bazaar and went to each pharmacy asking if they need a cotton picker and every single pharmacy confirmed that it had to participate in cotton picking by paying money or sending an employee to pick cotton. Um, last year at least five deaths and one suicide attempt uh, have been documented related to the um, cotton harvest uh, so a neighborhood chairman and an employee of a state organization, both elderly men, they died of heart attack uh, on the field. And in September, a prisoner attempted suicide uh, after beating because he was not able to collect 100 kilogram of cotton per day. Two farmers hanged themselves. Uh, uh, they were unable to fulfill the plan for cotton and could not uh, repay the loans for the bank and they were threatened that their property would be confiscated. And 24 years old employee of Uzbek Spanish chemical plant uh, Amafos Maxam were, who was forcibly sent to pick cotton in September uh, he also died um, in, uh, in the hospital after uh, the uh, uh, fight with a local resident. Uh, but uh, our, he, we interviewed his parents and they told us that uh, he was on a sick leave, he didn't want to go to pick cotton, but his uh, supervisor was calling him and asked him to go and he could not refuse because he was only um, working uh, member of this family so you can find the video interview with his parents on our website so there are a lot of numbers of cases of coercion and extortion um, in order to force people to pick cotton against their will. so the problem is systematic and it must be solved by um, changing the system of uh, cotton uh, production and uh, this uh, would start with land reforms and agriculture sector itself and we have said many times that farmers should be given the opportunity to choose what they plant and uh, relieved from having to fulfill a cotton quota they need to be protected from threats of confiscation of their land for not fulfilling the quota and unfortunately, these structural changes have not yet uh, happened. And as a result, we have again observed massive forced labor in the autumn last year. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Umida. It looks like we do have uh, Bennett on the phone and actually let me just double check and Allison did you have anything else you would like to add with this year's harvest I think Umida hit upon the main points um, I would just underscore the very last thing she said which is that they, we are really looking for some um, deep policy changes that can address the structural causes of root, lab, uh, root causes of forced labor we really um, welcome the, the government's professed commitment to addressing the problem and some of the changes like the increase in salary have been important but to really eliminate the problem as we saw this year um, are, is are going to require structural changes and i'm happy to participate in the question and answer if i can add any more information then okay great that's a really good lead in to uh bennett freeman uh who i believe is now on the call um and also i wanted to point out that there was a really good blog post which was is on the cotton campaign website it's also um we reference it on the responsible sourcing network website we'll make sure we have that link for you all afterwards um, that goes over a lot of those structural changes uh, that we'd still like to see that Allison was pointing out, as well as some of the general overall findings of the 2018 um, harvest. Um, Bennett, do you want to jump in here?
and just want to make sure you're unmuted. Marin, could you unmute Bennett? All right, for a moment there while right. Bennett is, here. oh, there we go. There you go. Okay. Sorry for having difficulty in, in coming in. Uh, and let me just take a few minutes to uh, Actually, make Bennett, a few could you, I'm sorry, points. Bennett, could you, um, I believe you need to mute, maybe you're on the, both the computer and the phone. So you need to mute one of those. We're getting a bit of feedback. I don't know echo. which one is more. Can you turn this one off? Okay. Hi. Can you hear me clearly now? Yes, that works. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Um, so let me, I listened to um, your opening, Patricia, as well as to Amita's very good specific points, as well as what Allison just said. And let me just take a few minutes to make some broad points that I hope are helpful to everybody on the call here. Um, we have been at this now since late 2007 for over a decade. And it's really important to recognize the scale of the challenge that we've been up against. The massive forced labor in the Uzbek cotton sector goes back to the early Stalinist period of the 1930s, was perpetuated through the first quarter century of post-Soviet independence for Uzbekistan under uh, President Karimov. Uh, and we are now at a hopeful point uh, with a reform effort underway with significant progress having been achieved in the last several months, but with many, many problems and challenges and indeed obstacles ahead before we can really declare success. Uh, because we're addressing uh, practices that go back 80 some years. Uh, it is natural and obvious that the reform process that was uh, announced and launched by the new president uh, about 18 months ago must take several years to really achieve success. Uh, the cotton campaign has been well positioned to uh, make a significant impact, not only because we've been at it together for over a decade, but because we represent a remarkably diverse multi-stakeholder coalition, all committed to the same objective. And we've been aligned together from beginning, from the very beginning to this uh, hopeful, but still very challenging juncture uh, where we are now. We've, from the beginning, we've been a coalition of not only NGOs and unions, but also of major global apparel brands, uh, uh, mostly based in Europe and North America, but also of responsible investors. And we've also been informed by academic experts, a really remarkably cohesive as well as diverse coalition. So the progress that's been underway uh, goes back a half a dozen years in terms of the virtual uh, elimination of child labor in the cotton harvest, but it's only been in the last 18 months that there's been any real serious commitment, focus, or tangible progress on the broader problem of adult forced labor. So we began to see those efforts uh, uh, not systematically, but uh, uh, kind of on an ad. Hello, this is Patricia Jerwitz. I'm talking and not sure if everybody can hear me. Do we still have Bennett? And actually, Marin, I just want to confirm that you could hear me. Seems like we're having a technical difficulty. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so did we lose Bennett? Yes, I can still. Bennett, are you still with us?
Okay, sorry everybody for all the technical difficulty. Um, I'm not hearing Bennett, and I thought my phone dropped, so I had uh, gotten off, but hopefully um, you're all still with us. And uh, what I know that Bennett was um, moving toward, and I appreciate all of his remarks giving a bit more of the context, is that we need to stick together uh, through this reform. Uh, the Cotton Campaign is going to be meeting with the Deputy Prime Minister as well as the Labor Minister in early February. We have meetings set up with the IFC, the ILO, U.S. government representatives, um, the Ambassador of Uzbekistan. Uh, it's quite exciting that we are having these high-level talks. We're looking forward to defining success uh, that we would like to see um, of a few key steps that still need to occur, and we have evidence on the ground of the of both people not being uh, forced to work against their will, and there's no menace of penalty, but also that monitors are free to observe the harvest. We know that there's also a very large need for workers to have freedom of association and collective bargaining, especially the temporary harvest workers, and um, all of those things still need to occur in the country before uh, we feel that we could really declare that forced labor has indeed ended and that there is success in Uzbekistan. We're having a lot of those high-level meetings in the coming months. And the 2019 harvest will be able to reflect whether that's really happening. Um, the other changes afoot in the country is that there's a lot of privatization of the industry going on. Just because the industry ha is privatized does not necessarily mean that forced labor will end. And so that's another thing that we'll very much be paying attention to um, and uh, watching. Um, uh, in regards to the Cotton Pledge, since I know several of you or many of you listening are signatories to the Cotton Pledge, um, that, that's part of the definition of success of the criteria we would like to see met prior to ending the pledge. We also need to look and see if there could be exceptions or adjustments to the pledge before it's completely ended. Um, so all of that is uh, we'll, we could address it a bit more in the Q&A, but I just wanted to uh, put all of that out there, that that's, those are all the discussions and conversations that we are having. If you're all um, invited to join the meeting with the U.S. government on the morning of February 5th in Washington, D.C., we also have a call-in number for that. Uh, and if there are brands that would like to join us um, uh, for those meetings, we have brand-specific meeting. Um, you're more than welcome to do that. I think Bennett, you might um, yeah. be there again. Yeah, I'm back. Okay, now. great. To wrap up, and I, I'm sorry, I just got I got muted again, and now on, on. But just to wrap up, and I heard what you just said. I think that the the key point here is to emphasize that this is the critical, pivotal juncture for the cotton campaign and more broadly our efforts in Uzbekistan. We have to maintain the alignment of all of our uh, uh, partners and stakeholders, uh, brands, investors, NGOs, trade unionists, uh, that has brought us to this hopeful point. Uh, we've had remarkable degree of cohesion and alignment. We've got to stick together in 2019, 2020, What's within reach here is an historic achievement of ending the most massive example uh, of forced labor in any sector in any country in the world. God knows there's forced labor in dozens and dozens, over a hundred other countries. There's forced labor on a huge scale. We'll hear about in a moment in Turkmenistan where little progress is being made, where we need to focus now but we are within reach if we stick together, define success, and be clear and consistent in pursuing our objectives, continue to engage with the Uzbek government, the ILO, other international partners, 
uh, we are within sight of the next couple or several years of an historic achievement together. So let me just end on, on that and back to you, Patricia. Great, thanks, Bennett. Uh, so we can answer any questions about that at the end, but at this moment, we'll move on to hearing from our next speaker, Ruslan, uh, to talk about the uh, 2018 Turkmenistan harvest. Uh, and as Bennett mentioned, we're at very early stages of that the dialogue and engagement. Unfortunately, although we have reached out to the Turkmenistan government, there has been no response or willingness to meet with us at this point. But I, as you've all seen, we do have a lot of stamina. Um, I'm really hoping it's not going to take another 11 years to uh, have Turkmenistan uh, come to the table to start to dialogue with us. Uh, but as uh, we've seen that if we all stick together and look at a variety of strategies on how to encourage change, uh, ideally that will happen in Turkmenistan as well. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Ruslan. Thank you very much, Patricia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ruslan Miatif. I am a journalist from Turkmenistan and uh, the editor of Alternative Turkmenistan News. It's an independent media and uh, human rights initiative dedicated to the promotion of freedom of speech and the rule of law in my country. Um, let me briefly tell you about Turkmenistan because it's uh, one of those countries that uh, very few uh, perhaps have heard of. Uh, if we can turn the slide, please. Turkmenistan is a country that is run by a guy on the right. His name is uh, Gurban Guli Berde Muhammadov. He's the president of Turkmenistan, and he came to power in 2007 after a sudden death of the first Turkmen dictator, Sapar Murat Niyazov, who had ruled the country for 21 years. Uh, Berdo Muhammadov's ruling style is not any different from that of his predecessor, unfortunately. Press freedom in Turkmenistan is non-existent, all media belong to the state, and naturally they carry the official line. Uh, Reporters Without Borders ranked Turkmenistan 178 out of 180 countries in the world, leaving only Eritrea and North Korea behind. Similarly, Transparency International in its uh, Doing Business uh, Index of 2017 ranked Turkmenistan very low and this group looks at uh, such indicators as the rule of law, level of corruption, ease of business registration, etc. Economic freedom in Turkmenistan is also limited. It is the state that fully manages most of the industries, including the cotton industry, uh, starting from its cultivation, processing, and the international sales. We'll get to that a bit later. Lastly, the Turkmen society is not free, according to Freedom House. There is no freedom of speech or the press, no transparent, competitive, or fair elections. It is the country where the president's word is a law. I have sh I'm showing here some faces of uh, Turkmen journalists and activists that were harassed and I would like to focus uh, if you if Mary, can you click on yes this guy Mansur Mingelov uh, he's uh, serving a 22 year prison term for complaining to the president and western diplomats in Turkmenistan about police brutalities and one more click this guy is Gaspar Matalaev. Uh, his three-year prison term is supposed uh, to come to an end in September 2019. And the reason he is in prison is because of his independent monitoring of forced adult and child labor in Turkmenistan during cotton harvesting season. We'll get to that later as well. Lastly, Turkmenistan is often criticized for restricting religious freedom. While the country is largely populated by Muslims, people, especially young men, are tortured, tortured and later imprisoned for being, quote-unquote, too religious. While the government allows Orthodox churches, the community of Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, is denied registration, and its young male members are given prison terms for refusing to perform mandatory military service, which is against the group's beliefs. 
So this is just in a nutshell background about Turkmenistan. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, Turkmenistan is the ninth uh, cotton producer, largest cotton producers in the world, according to World Atlas. And uh, cotton sales is the country's number three uh, income source after natural gas and oil sales. Uh, cotton is being grown on a territory of uh, over 2,000 square miles, which is almost five times the total area of Los Angeles, including its water surface. And the entire uh, industry is the, the industry is entirely managed by the state. Uh, all arable lands in Turkmenistan belong to the state and farmers only lease it. The state tells the farmers what to grow on the lands. Usually it's cotton, wheat or rice, when to plant the seeds, when to water the fields and when to start harvesting the crop. It's the state that provides farmers with seeds, chemicals, fertilizers, as well as mechanical services to plow the fields, for example. Farmers are allowed to sell the cotton only to the state and at prices established by the state. The state owns all gins and spinning mills. Most of textile plants are owned by the state, with a few exceptions of joint Turkmen Turkish ventures, for example. In uh, the, the there is a state plan. Uh, it's uh, almost two times more than two times uh, fewer than in Uzbekistan. It's one million and fifty thousand tons, and I gave here an approximate you know that you can visualize. It's twenty times the weight of Titanic, if that makes any sense. In 2018, the state media reported there were over a thousand machine harvesters in the fields. Around 70% of cotton is processed in Turkmenistan, and uh, in 2017, <clears throat> also according to state media, there were 67 textile plants uh, in the country, and the country produces uh, garments, jeans, towels, bed linen, and socks. Next, please. Though machine harvesters are seen in the fields, the majority of Turkmen cotton is picked manually by tens of thousands of civil servants, that is school and kin kindergarten teachers, doctors and hospital personnel, employees of tens of other organizations and enterprises that are funded by the state. By, by the state. It's banks, factories, utility companies, etc. Cotton picking is mandatory even for military consp uh, conscripts. If civil servants are paid some money for every kilogram they pick, the conscripts get nothing. Their money is taken away by military commanders. Next slide, please. And one more. And one more. Uh, these are just some of this year's headlines. For civil servants, participation in the cotton harvesting is a must. They either go to the fields themselves or pay money to their supervisors who then hire replacement workers. Those who refuse to accept either of the two options, pick or pay, are threatened to lose their jobs. The daily pay is $1. I'm converting the local Turkmen money into dollars so that you can understand. And this pick or pay rule lasts from the end of August until mid-December. It means that, an, that if an employee hires a replacement, then during the entire cotton season, he must pay his supervisors slightly over 100 American dollars. Is that a lot? Well, the average salary in Turkmenistan, I tell you, is $50. A kindergarten nanny's wage, for example, is $45 a month. So for people, losing their two months salary is actually quite significant. Many ask a very reasonable question why, instead of spending this money on their families and children, they have to pay somebody to do work that they have absolutely nothing to do with. Yet, in most of the cases, civil servants submit to these orders because finding another job in Turkmenistan is nearly impossible because uh, the unemployment rate is around 50%. Next slide, please. In 2013, my NGO, Alternative Turkmenistan News, has joined the cotton campaign 
uh, an international coalition of trade unions, businesses, human rights organizations and others to monitor the use of forced labor. Just like in Uzbekistan, forced labor has been a problem since the Soviet times, even though in 1997 the state signed and ratified the ILO Convention 105 on abolition of forced labor, the problem remains until today. ATN's trade, trained monitors operate in Turkmenistan undercover, and I'll explain why uh, later. They physically, next slide please, they physically visit the fields, talk to forced uh, laborers, observe the working conditions, whether people are given food and drinking water, whether or not they're paid at the end of the working day, etc. In most of the cases, the for forced laborers must bring their own food and water. The latter runs out quickly in hot September days, and people often have to drink well water or even ditch water. As for lunch, often it's just some bread and tea, because very few can afford something more nutritious. Next slide, please. There is something wrong with the order of the slides, but uh, anyway, um, let me get to child labor since we have seen those slides already. Uh, child labor on cotton fields remains a problem despite the ban on it imposed by the president in 2008. Throughout 2015, 2016 and 2017, we reported about systematic use of child labor. School children of age 12 to 16 are sent to the cotton fields by orders from the regional education departments, which in turn receive such orders from the regional governors. This means that the forced child labor is endorsed by the state. Working conditions and picking quotas for children are the same as for uh, adults. It's 50 kilograms a day or 110 pounds. In 2018, after much international criticism, our monitors have not observed organized uh, use of child labor when school administrations would massively send children to pick cotton. But it does not mean that this practice has come to an end. In 2018, our monitors have seen individual children on cotton fields. Some went to pick cotton to earn some money. Others said uh, they replaced uh, their, uh, their family members. Next slide, please. In the beginning, I promised to tell you about Gaspar Matalaev, our monitor who was arrested in Turkmenistan in October 2016, just two days after we published his uh, extensive report on forced labor. In the police, Gaspar was beaten and tortured with electric current and forced to confess to crimes he had never committed. A month later, the court, the court found him guilty in allegedly committing fraud. He was given three years in prison and he remains there despite numerous international calls for his release, including a call from the United Nations Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. In September, as I said, his term will finish and we just hope that the authorities won't extend it by uh, staging, for example, a fight in prison or faking other crimes. In Turkmenistan, unfortunately, it's a common practice when non-loyal activists get uh, their prison terms prolonged. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, one of the examples uh, of uh, Gaspar's work. Uh, from end of August till mid-December, every morning people uh, gather at so-called pickup points. Uh, it's various places in towns and cities to board buses and to be taken to cotton fields. As you can see on the pictures, people often have to travel tens of miles in the back of a truck. It's needless to say that uh, this poses uh, great risks to the safety of people. And there have been numerous cases when uh, due to bad road surface, for instance, trucks would roll over, injuring or even killing those on board. Next, please. Um, our goal is uh, to put an end to the use of forced adult and child labor in Turkmenistan. The authorities, and the problem is that the authorities don't recognize the problem and refuse to work both with us, the cotton campaign, and with the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, Modern Slavery uh, to find possible solutions. For the state, 
it is much cheaper to send tens of thousands of uh, civil servants, soldiers and children to the cotton fields than reform the entire industry and mechanize cotton harvesting. Since uh, there is no engagement from uh, the government side and no visible progress, we work with uh, companies and brands and urge them not to source uh, cotton or garments from Turkmenistan. Our engagement with uh, such names as uh, H&M, IKEA, Inditex and some, other, some others resulted in their public statements that they won't buy from Turkmenistan. We believe that the more companies there are to say and do the same, the sooner we'll, we will reach our goal to eradicate forced labor in, in Turkmenistan. Next slide, please. These are some of the photos that uh, we made uh, in Turkmenistan uh, in, in, in uh, 2016 and 2017. Uh, we can see that uh, the jeans bearing very big names, Western names, are being sold in Turkmenistan. Maybe it's because uh, companies refused and uh, the Turkmen officials simply dumped all of these jeans into the local markets. Uh, we don't know the real reason, but the fact is that uh, jeans produced in Turkmenistan uh, used to bear these big names. And next, this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I will welcome them and uh, answer them. Patricia? Great. Thanks, Ruslan. Uh, and we have everybody's email addresses here if you want to contact them all directly and actually Marin great if you could leave it there perfect um, at this point uh, we will first understand if there are any uh, written uh, questions uh, that we could answer and Marin if you could read those for us please also um. if you sorry um, if if you do have a question please click on the raise hand uh, in the dashboard of the GoToMeeting so that we could unmute your phone and also have you ask us a question. Marin? Yes, let me, I'm not seeing any questions yet. Um, Okay. Um, well, and we there is one question from Sylvie Lang. Let me connect her to the audio. Okay. We have one question from Felicitas Weber. She asked, is a similar momentum as in Uzbekistan possible and likely in Turkmenistan? Um, I, that's, shall I? Go ahead, uh, shall I, Yeah. Well, yeah, go uh, ahead and I can add. Yes, uh, in Uzbekistan, I believe maybe my colleagues from the country can uh, correct me, the change even this, uh, you know, very modest change at this point was possible only uh, due to the death of the former president. Uh, my feeling is that uh, had he not died back then, we would not have uh, seen these modest changes. Uh, in Turkmenistan, it's the same thing. The country, the government, though it does not recognize uh, the problem at the moment, uh, it is still taking some very cautious, very, very cautious steps uh, to improve the situation. The country, for example, continues to buy uh, machine harvesters. State media at least report that uh, the purchasing price uh, will be uh, gradually increased both for the farmers and for the cotton pickers. We don't see it yet. Uh, the intention, as we see, is there. Uh, but until until people are being forcibly sent to the fields, until independent monitors are being imprisoned, uh, it's hard to say that these intentions of the government really mean something significant and uh, that they're genuine to, to changes. Patricia? 
Uh, great. Thanks, Ruslan. Um, my understanding is also uh, due to the amount of repression in Turkmenistan, which, uh, you know, is equal or worse than Uzbekistan, um, that that's really a, a big challenge. And the bit challenge it uh, offers us or, or poses for us, rather, is that it's difficult to get photos and documentation as to what's actually happening um, due to the amount of uh, repercussions. As you saw, um, Gustav has been in jail now going on uh, three years for having reported on the harvest. So being able to tell the stories of what is going on is very challenging. And I really commend Ruslan and his team of undercover monitors for getting this information out uh, because without it, you know, we couldn't do anything about it. Um, what the other advantage we have going for us regarding Turkmenistan is that the United States government has the um, the agency, which is Customs and Border Protection (CBP), has put Turkmenistan um, on its withhold and release list for all cotton or or any product made in whole or in part with cotton from Turkmenistan. Um, this is unprecedented that it's the first time that an entire country has been listed on their withhold release list, not just one supplier. So um, the repercussions of that is that um, products could be held at the border, shipments could be stopped from entering the United States if the CBP has um, reason to believe that that product was made in, um, from cotton from Turkmenistan, um, as well as legal um, acts could be taken against the company. So I think that economic pressure will help um, change this situation in Turkmenistan. Um, but we do invite you to have your company sign the Turkmenistan pledge. Um, we're now at, I believe it's 46 brands and retailers have uh, put their names on that pledge. But uh, we heard over and over again in Uzbekistan when we were the delegation, the cotton campaign delegation was visiting there in May that everyone wanted to sunset the pledge. That indeed it has made a big difference in minimizing sale and marketing opportunities for Uzbek cotton. And we'd like to put the same pressure on Turkmenistan while this um, continues, this abusive practice continues. Great, thanks. We have one more question from Ramesh Panavali of BCI. Um, the question is, does initiatives like Better Cotton help driving transparency? Help drive transparency? I think that's all. Uh, great, thanks. Um, you know, I think that BCI does have uh, decent the decent work uh, principles and criteria that are required of farmers are really great. Wait, let me um, let it does I'm unmute Ramesh because he raised his hand. All right, you're unmuted. Sorry, yeah, I'm from Debenhams. Sorry, not from this guy. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, but in regards to the BCI um, cotton, that those that it is a, um, a process of uh, addressing the minimization of forced labor on cotton farms. Um, one thing we are looking into is um, there is a project that the International Finance Corporation is trying to um, see if the um, principles and criteria of better cotton could be met in Uzbekistan, at least on some initial, they're doing a pilot on some project farms. Um, and one of the aspects I'm noticing in reviewing some of that documentation is in the recruitment. The, although no forced labor is um, allowed, and that's a core criteria of better cotton, um, I think there needs to be a bit more detail into how that is um, analyzed and that the assurance process is there. Um, because of the state 
management in both of these countries of the entire cotton sectors. It's not typically the farmer who is doing the recruitment of the of the temporary harvest workers. It's officials, local officials, and they're the ones that manipulate the system any welfare benefits. Um, they work with the heads of the schools and the hospitals and the other um, and factories, et cetera, to uh, put the pressure on people to harvest the cotton. So I think um, I'm hopeful that we can look at how to both strengthen better cotton initiative uh, principles and criteria for forced labor, as well as how can mechanism such as that be used to actually uh, be able to verify and are the assurance processes um, sufficient what may be sufficient in other countries may not be sufficient in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan so how do we strengthen those to have the assurance of no forced labor on uh, project farms or or any or a farm for example that maybe could be licensed by BCI in the future I think we have a question maybe time for one more question and did that Sylvia um, Yes, want to ask a question? Um, it's from Danielle Klassman, and it's what percent of Turkmen cotton is dedicated to export products versus for domestic consumption? Ruslan, can you take that? Uh, I can take that, but uh, I don't think I can uh, say something uh, valuable because Turkmenistan is a very closed country especially when it comes to figures, giving out figures, and uh, we don't even know the size of population of Turkmenistan. In 2012, there was a census, but no results were released to the public. So only from uh, rare, very rare media reports, we can judge, uh, you know, the amount of uh, cotton that is being uh, processed in Turkmenistan and uh, the rest sold uh, overseas. In my presentation, I said that 70% of uh, cotton is being processed in Turkmenistan. And uh, last year, there were media reports that, uh, quote unquote, in, in the coming future, uh, this figure will get to 100%. So, see they really vaguely give this information and uh, there's there's no credible information simply and the only other um, data point that we've seen on the MIT's world bat list is that uh, um, Turkmenistan exports um, about of its exports 75 percent or so goes to Turkey so there is um, interest in having a better understanding of where Turkmenistan cotton is flowing to Turkey. Um, I have seen Turkmenistan cotton in Turkey myself when I visited a, a spinning mill, and I think that that might be the, a big risk for companies currently if they are indeed sourcing in Turkey. Um, we're already at the top of the hour, so with that, I will wrap it up. I want to thank our panelists, Bennett Freeman, Umida Niyazova, Alison Gill, and Ruslan. Um, my ATF. So thank you all so much. Um, and we look forward to having you join us ideally in person, but also by phone with our upcoming meetings in, uh, in Washington, D.C. in the first week of February. Please contact us if you're interested in attending. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Okay. I'm going to get you back to the phone today.